morning, everybody. Welcome to the Naples Preserve. Even if it is virtually, we're glad you're here. Hi, my name's Becky. I'm one of the staff members here at the Naples Preserve. So let's get started because I happen to be your presenter today. We're going to talk about restoration at the Naples Preserve. But before we do that, let's get a little bit of history of the property. So this is an aerial view over the part of the city of Naples. You see where north is, it's to the top of the screen. And there's the Coastland Center Mall, Fleshman Park. We have the Lake Park neighborhood and Coquina Sands, which is a neighborhood. And where's the preserve? Right smack dab in the middle of all this development. The development around the preserve happened, started in the late 1950s and really got going in the 1960s. So it is not recent development. This piece of property went up for sale in the late 1990s. Um, it's 9.47 acres. The city made two attempts to acquire a grant for Florida um, Forever Funds from Florida Communities Trust. And both times we just didn't make the list. There are so many places within the state of Florida that are asking for money. So we were way down on the list. So what happened is there's what the cost was, $8 million for 9.47 acres. Imagine how much, imagine what this property is worth today. Good thing it can't be developed, right? So because uh, they weren't able to get a grant yet, the residents voted three to one, three to one, yes, for the land acquisition bond referendum, because it was the citizens that went to the city to ask them to buy this property. It was the last green space within the city of Naples and people did not want it developed. So on April 11th, the city, uh, in 2000, the city purchased the property. And you'll notice there's about $33,000 more tagged down to the price. That has to do with different fees that had to be paid in order to purchase the property. You know, they had to have surveys, insurance, and the list just went on. It really adds up fast. And then third, third try is charm. In 2002, they did get a grant from Florida Communities Trust. Florida Forever funds, and that is money that is appropriated by the legislature. So that's state tax money. So what is on this property that was saved? Let's take a look. We have pine flatwoods, oak rosemary scrub, and down here we have what we're calling the grassy meadow. The photograph you see is currently what it looks like within that square that was just drawn. This area was degraded many, many decades ago, and it's struggling. It's trying to come back to what it would have been, but it's going to need our help. Then also in the grassy meadow down at the far south end, this is what it looks like today. There's a lot of trees there, and if you go in there and look, there are some very old southern slash pines. So that tells us that that area used to be a pine flatwoods, but we're having other tree species move in now and they're um, changing the habitat there. So deck three came up, um, just remember kind of where it is. I'm gonna reference that later when we're talking about restoration, the different areas we're in. So you know exactly where we are on the property. There also is that former wetland. So the Plant life there, the plant community is a little bit different. You cannot see it from the boardwalk, but you can see it from the sidewalk on 10th Street North. So natural disturbances, the pine flatwoods and the scrub have had to adapt to two natural disturbances that occur down here. So do you know what they are? Let's, let's find out. Number one, hurricanes. Who thought hurricanes could be good? They actually help our habitats because the habitats had to adapt to them. So now they, they kind of need a hurricane. So what happens during a hurricane? Well, the wind knocks a lot of trees down. So this, what you're looking at, this is in the preserve, Hurricane Irma. This is, or I should say was, our national champion myrtle oak tree. And believe it or not, it's a good thing it went over in the hurricane. 
Why am I saying that? Well, it turned out it was rotten at the bottom because the debris built up. And it was a really old tree. It never would have even reached this size if we had been having fire in here. So, you know, it's a good thing I went over in the hurricane because nobody would have been standing on the boardwalk. What else does wind do? Besides, knock, well, knocking down trees is a good. Well, yeah, it opens up the canopy so more sunlight can hit the ground. Also, if it happens in a swamp, there you have a nice dry platform out there in the swamp where plants can grow and animals can get up on there and, you know, a dry area and also where they can bask. Because remember, since that tree came down, it's opened up the canopy, the sunlight can come down. Also in the swamp where the tree went down, there's going to be a depress depression where the base of the tree was. There you're going to have deeper water, so you're going to have a temperature variance in there. And also in the dry season when the swamp starts to dry up, that's in a spot where the water will remain a little bit longer. And another good thing about wind during a hurricane is seed dispersal. I know down at Fakahatchee Strand, they were hoping that Irma brought seeds from Cuba, orchid seeds from Cuba to the strand to help replenish their orchids. In our flatwoods, tops of the pines were, um, came off, which of course kills the tree. So is that remaining part of the tree that's still standing there, is it good for anything? Let's see. Oh yeah, all the insects move in there. Here we have termites, and that's a wood borer grub that you see there, a larva. So there are all these insects in what's remaining of the tree that's standing. So what is it? Oh wow, that's a buffet for all the woodpeckers that are down here, that live here. This is a red pileated woodpecker. This is a male. If you look there at the base of his beak, <clears throat> you'll see that red stripe. That's called a mustache. And that denotes this as being a male. Yeah, the females don't have the mustaches. And also, what's remaining of that tree standing, look at, you've got a great home for our woodpeckers. So, important. Also, when the tree broke off, here again, it opens up the canopy, lets the sunlight hit the ground. Water, we get a lot of rain with a hurricane. This is our scrub that flooded. And there were one and two month old gopher tortoises living out there, but they live in Southwest Florida, so they know how to swim. So all they did is they floated next to their burrows for a couple of days until the water receded. Something that didn't do well with the flooding were these big grubs. They're about two and a half, three inches long. They live under the sand out in the scrub. They're eating the dead wood and things that are underground. They were casualties of the flooding out in the scrub. Our Florida box turtles were out there enjoying the water. And you know what? I think they might have been enjoying something else too because they love to eat those big grubs. So on March 30th, Jordan Denini, who's a professor at Florida Southwestern State College, will be our presenter. He's doing a study on the turtles down here in Southwest Florida. And a big part of his study is on the Florida box turtle. And guess what? Our population of Florida box turtles are in his study. Matter of fact, this one they named Charlie. So you wanna tune into that program for sure. Find out what he's discovered is going on here with our box turtles. The second, <clears throat> the second natural disturbance would be fire. This is the really, really important one. Fire would start naturally by the lightning that we have down here in Southwest Florida. The smoke you're looking at actually is from a Picayune fire several years ago. We could see the smoke and the ashes were falling. And this is what it looked, out, looked like out there in Picayune after the fire. So what good does a fire do? For the habitats. I know people don't like it, but what good does it do for the habitat? Remember, these habitats had adapted to fire, so now they need them. For one thing, it burns off all the understory, clears the ground so the sunlight can hit the ground, so that the rainwater can get into the ground. That allows the plants to regrow, allows, allows seeds to germinate. Now, the southern slash pine that we have down here 
actually have protection from fire. If you're here at the preserve, take a look at our pine trees. The bark is in thin layers and it's compressed. It's like, it's like looking at the pages in a book when the book is closed. Have you ever tried to burn a book or a magazine? It's not gonna happen unless you break it up. You have to get air in there. The other way that the pine protect themselves is the lower branches die off. So there aren't any low branches for the flames to reach. Unfortunately, the photograph that you're looking at of Picayune, all those trees were killed. They have this protection that I just talked about. However, there hadn't been a fire there for a very long time. So the fuel load was very, very high. So the flames were high. There were high winds. There were probably vines growing up the trees. Vines are like a fuse taking the flames right up into the tops of the trees. And not only that, the cabbage palms that were there act like a torch. So what happened is the fire got up into the top of the trees and so that's why they died. We have had a fire at the Naples Preserve, believe it or not. This is on the corner of 10th Street North and Fleshman Boulevard. So looking at this photo right now, the Coastland Center Mall would be to our back. That's to give you an idea where this is located. Why did it start? Right there, there's the culprit, that cabbage palm. It had grown up into the power lines and sparked a fire. Since this is in a very visible location, someone called it in and the fire department was there immediately and put out the fire. So this, did you notice it's on Friday the 13th? So that seems like a bad sign, right? Friday the 13th of fire. Well, it actually was good. It was a lucky Friday the 13th because look what appeared a few weeks later. It was a sea of blue in that area. This photograph doesn't even do it justice. It was so beautiful. The white mouth day flowers. There were a few there before the fire, but after the fire, there was a profusion of them. And not only were there more of them, but they were larger. It was, and there were other native flowers in there too. It was just beautiful. So why did this happen? There wasn't much debris there to begin with. So the sunlight had been hitting the ground. The rainwater was hitting the ground. So what made the difference? It was the ash from the fire. You need to remember, this is all sand down here. Sand is very low in nutrients if it has any at all. That ash, the ash is the fertilizer for the plants. It is super, super important. And some of the day flowers actually were white. So sustain, the habitats we just talked about have adapted to these two natural um, disturbances. So the question is, if, they, if these disturbances are denied, now hurricane we can't do anything about, but we can deny fire. If it's denied, are these habitats going to be able to sustain themselves? Let's find out what happens if fire is denied or suppressed. For one thing, the vines take over. They'll just cover everything. Here they're covering an oak tree. The oak tree will probably die because it can't get any sunlight. If there are any air plants, Tillandsia is there. They're not getting any sunlight. It's, there's no sunlight hitting the ground. We have exotics come up. You'll have native trees that don't belong in that habitat, would normally be found there. They start moving in because a fire also will kill many exotics or non-natives that are moving into the area. Not all of them, but most of them. And it will also either kill or really set back natives that are moving into the area that are trying to turn it to a different plant community. The ground, this is in our flatwoods when we very started our first restoration out there. If you look in this area, notice that the pine straw is up to where the fronds are emanating. That is 20 inches deep. What can grow under 20 inches of pine straw? Nothing. So the sunlight's not hitting the ground. Not only that, the water wasn't getting to the ground. It was almost like concrete underneath all this. and. Proof of that is the saw palmetto, instead of 
having the roots grow downwards into the ground, they were actually growing up into the air looking for moisture. And that was for the same for the slash pines. We found roots growing up looking for moisture. So succession, that is when, this is the one thing that fire helps to suppress, and that's other plants moving into an established community and changing what the community is. So let's take a look at some examples of succession. This is along 10th Street North. These are sable palms, but I always call them cabbage palms. That's the other name for them. And you notice, look how thick it is. It's like a hedge. And let's take another look. It's a hedge, it's in a straight row and nothing is growing under them except for some non-native landscape plants that are under there. But they've shaded everything. Native plants, the plants that belong in this area don't have a chance. So I mentioned it looks like a hedge. There's a, re it was planted, believe it or not, but not by humans. So look at this photograph. Do you have any idea how these cabbage palms were planted? If you watch closely, you might see a clue up here. That's right, the birds. The birds love to sit on the power lines that are right above this strip of cabbage palms. So what did they do? They eat the cabbage palm fruit. Cabbage palms are really important for wildlife. And then the birds come and sit on the wires and preen themselves and deposit the seeds with fertilizer. So since the natural disturbance of fire is suppressed, this is when humans have to step in and we, we, we kind of act do what a fire would do, but we're not able to do everything because we cannot provide the ash. But let's see what we do here at the Naples Preserve to try to help our habitats. We have volunteers help. These are just a few of the groups that have come to help. And the city also has contractors come in twice a year and they'll pull the vines out of the trees and they will treat the category one and category two exotics. FGCU, Florida Gulf Coast University, this is where the majority of our volunteers um, come from. And it's because of a class called colloquium. Colloquium has to be taken by every student and passed by them that is going to graduate from this university. It's a, a give back, a concession. The school was built on a, some land that was sensitive. So the colloquium class teaches about the environment, the habitats down here. And the big thing is it teaches about sustainability. Not only sustainability of our habitats down here in Southwest Florida, but also sustainability in everyday life, sustainability in their future careers. Because remember, everything we do affects the environment. So it's everything's connected. So just, just to let you know, the photographs you're going to be seeing now are not recent. So that's why you're not going to see the restrictions with the mask. So what do we do out there? Well, we're out there pulling vines out of the ground, pulling them out of the trees, using all kinds of equipment. And we use shovels a lot. So the pile of rhizomes you see next to the shovel came out of the ground from behind these two small, they're actually small, slash pines. That's um, Smilex, and that is just a drop in the bucket as to what we remove from out there. So let's learn a little bit about this Smilex. It is native, it does belong out there. It's important for wildlife. The gopher tortoises, for instance, like to eat the leaves if the vine is on the ground. And it produces a berry that the birds r relish. However, because there hasn't been a fire, it has gotten out of control. Students will ask, why are we removing native plants that belong here? It's because the balance is gone because there hasn't been a fire. So we're not removing them all. We're just trying to get that balance back. It's not easy to remove them. You saw the tubers, not only that, they have some really nasty thorns on their stem. Let's take a look at these rhizomes that from which uh, it grows. They're not easy to get out. They'll grow in a clump and they can be two or three deep. 
they have those long roots that go down. They're like wires. They go down in and hold them in the ground. And the area where they're growing can be um, as big. I've seen it as big as five or six feet across in diameter. So the students that work on this really work hard. And after they're done, they are so proud of themselves. And you know what? They deserve to be proud of themselves. They know that they're helping the preserve sustain itself. The new growth on the Smile X is edible. It tastes like um, young raw asparagus. And people think that perhaps the Calusa Indians would eat the new growth. Also, the, the rhizomes, they think the Calusa might have ground those up to make a flower. Now, something you can do today, here's an experiment if you have children, you'd have to get these, but have you ever made a battery using a potato? Well, you can do the same thing with the rhizomes from the Smile X. You need the newer growth ones, they're lighter in color. And guess what? You actually get more energy from one of these than a potato. It's about 0.8 volts. So we're out there, we're cutting everything down, we're clearing, we're getting down to the ground. So what do we do with all the debris? It's put in those trash cans and has to be taken up and put in a big open top dumpster. We usually get a 40 or 60 yard dumpster and it doesn't take long to fill that up. It's not boring out there. I know it's hard work, but discoveries. Oh, the things we discover when they're out there. This is what makes it exciting and makes it really worthwhile. So what's this discovery? Well, out there in the flatwoods, under that 20 inches of pine straw, we found a lot of homeless camps. This came from one of them. There were these two blankets, and there were actually two other ones that were rolled up in a bedroll. So the other two blankets, uh, the one facing you, the plaid is wool. The other two, one was a light blue one, um, cotton from Sears. And then the other one was a red one with a satin strip on the end. And they actually had a rope running through that. So they evidently used it to tie around a pine tree to make a tent. But this was rolled up in a bedroll. And the, the work boots you see on the left are right next to it. It was, you know, like you make your bed in the morning, you're coming back. So then you wonder what happened? Why, why is it still here? Did did they decide to leave? Were they chased off? Did they hopefully find an, a nice place to live? And we found tons of other things out there. Of course, a lot of clothing, Bic lighters, uh, disposable razors, a rear view mirror off a car, um, a book jacket from Mein Kampf, but we found an American flag too. So we're out there working, finding all these things and wondering about the lives of the people that were living in the woods. Of course, we found a lot of beer bottles and liquor bottles and lots of beer cans. I think we ended up with about 14 or 15 different brands. And the old Milwaukee, the one that you see at the bottom, that was the most common brand. Why? That was the cheap beer at the time. So you're wondering, why am I showing you all this? Well, you know what, these beer cans, and oh, by the way, they weren't all beer cans. Some of them were Coke cans, especially the Coke cans, helped us date when these camps were there. And how did we do that? Look at what a lot of them were on the top. If you recognize this, you're, you're dating yourself right there. This is a poll tab. They started using poll tabs in about 1964. And for those of you that weren't around then and don't know what I'm talking about, this the, it had a ring there, like the ones do today. You put your finger through the ring and you actually pulled the whole tab off. It would curl. It was sharp. You had to be careful. So what did people do with these tabs they pulled off? A lot of people just threw them on the ground. Some people put them back in the can. And then we had responsible people that put them in a trash can. But imagine yourself out there running on the beach in your bare feet and somebody's been out there throwing these pull tabs down. Not a pretty thing, is it? A cut on your foot on the beach with the salt water and the bacteria. And then sometimes the people that put the tab in the can would still have remaining drink in there. And when they drink it, they would swallow the tab. That would be like a razor blade in your throat. So a change had to be made. So in 1975, 
the stay tab, the one we have today, came in existence. So this is how it's helping us date the camps out there. The Coca-Cola had switched over to the stay tab in 1976. The Coca-Cola cans we found all had pull tabs. And almost all the other companies had switched to the stay tab by 1980. So that helped us date these camps that were out there. Also, if you look at the beer cans and look at the breweries, you can sometimes even get it down to a, within four or five years of when that camp existed. These are some recent finds. It's still before the city brought, bought the property. Um, yep, that's a TV remote you see there. Still had the batteries in it and we're still looking for the TV out there. Oh, these are the exciting finds, the living things. I know, it's a slug. What's exciting about a slug? It's just showing something else that uses the preserve as home. When we find things out there, we share them. Oh, here's two FGCU students. Looks like they found something. One's got her phone out. She's either taking a photograph or doing video. Let's see, maybe we can get a look at what they're seeing out there. Ah, a yellow garden orb weaver had caught a brown anole while we're there. And here it is, wrapping it up and preparing it for brunch. Ah, the ogre face spider we found. I didn't think we'd find one of these. And, and see, that's the thing. Everything we find, we document. And it just shows over and over and over again why this property should be saved. We're just showing the tremendous amount of wildlife and later you'll see plant life that calls the preserve home. So the ogre face spider, it's big. First place, it, we weren't even sure it was a spider. Look at that body. So the females in this are the bigger ones. The body can be about 20 millimeters in length. So that's around three quarters of an inch long. But look at the legs on this. The thing was, it wasn't moving very much. And we're wondering what was wrong. It wasn't cold outside. It did not appear to be injured. Do you know what it was? It couldn't see. They're blind in the daylight. Why? Because they have some of the best night vision of any animal on this planet. So the way they capture the prey is they don't spin a big web. They spin a small one that's like a net that they hold in their front legs. And then they'll suspend themselves from a silk thread at night and just watch for some prey to come. And then they'll throw that net down on it. So the net is not sticky. It's more like yarn. So the prey becomes entangled in it. And then it'll bring that up and have lunch. Well, I guess it'd be a night, midnight snack. Great find, great find. Look at this, a horn span worm we found out there. It's a type of small moth that's down here. Look, isn't, isn't nature beautiful? Well, I think it's beautiful. Some of you may think it's bizarre, but another, another great, exciting find. Ah, this was a really important find. An eastern glass lizard. This is a young one. We knew there were glass lizards on the property, but we've never been able to catch one to ID it because there actually are three species that are in South Florida. So we found out it's the most common one, Eastern glass lizard, but hey, it's still exciting, right? These are an interesting animal. So where the arrow point is pointing, I've blown that up. That's the vent. That's where, you know, excrement comes out. That's the, uh, the opening on the other end. Everything, from that vent on is tail. They have an extremely long tail. And that's the one, one reason they're called a glass lizard is because to defend themselves, they will the tail will break off and it can break into pieces, you know, like dropping a glass, break shatters into pieces. So let's take a closer look. It is a lizard. It does not have legs, but it does have eyelids. That's a black southern racer that's at the top, no eyelids. What's another difference that makes it a lizard and not a snake? It has an external ear opening. When you touch one of these, it, it they don't feel like anything else. They're stiff. They're like hard and stiff. It doesn't really feel like a lizard or a snake. And why are they stiff? Underneath those scales you see, there are osteoderms. Now the osteoderm does not look like the one you see here. It's a bony deposit. 
the osteoderm that popped up on the screen is actually from an alligator. Alligators have osteoderms on their back. See the point? There's bone underneath that. So that makes this lizard very stiff. It can't bend. So there's one other feature that helps it bend. And that's this lateral groove. Those are soft scales in there so that the lizard is able to move. They spend a lot of time underground and being stiff like that helps them move through the sand down here. Oh, another good thing is this um, Brahmini blind snake. Okay, now I know it looks big in this photograph, but they're only about five to six inches long. When a lot of people find them, they're fossorial, so they're going to be underground. They think it's a, a worm, but it's not. They're not from here. They're from Asia. And what's interesting about them is they're parthenogenic. In other words, they're all females. Yes, they are self-fertilizing. So when you look at this one, it was a silver gray that usually when you see them, they're black. So they can be different colors. I want to ask you, which end is the head? Is it on the left or is it on the right? It's on the right. Let's take a closer look at the head. So as you can see, there aren't any eyes. There's a slight depression, but there's the mouth. There's the nostril. And if you watch closely in this video, you'll be able to spot that forked tongue. Did you, do you see it? So remember, this is only about five inches long. Oh, this summer when we were uh, doing an area out here, there was a grapevine growing right through the trunk of a dead saw palmetto, pulled it up and the trunk came apart and look what we found. Notice the size of these eggs. We knew they were snake eggs and there's only one native snake down here that it could lays this small of an egg. So kept the eggs and within 10 days they hatched, all three hatched and yes, we were right. Our suspicion was right. It's a southern ringneck. Now, an adult southern ringneck is only maybe 12 to, you know, 18 inches long. They're not very big. So this is deceiving when you look at this photograph. This is one of the hatchlings. It is only four inches long. A defense um, mechanism that the southern ringneck uses is it'll curl its tail up and flip it up and it's orange or red underneath trying to look scary and scare away a predator. These little ones did, were doing that but they didn't have the color yet so it didn't do much good. So we, I released them back where those eggs were. There was a lot of leaf litter there for them. So is all this hard work, are we getting any results? Well, you get results, but are they good or bad? So let's see what's happening out here in the areas that we have, that we're working restoration. A lot of plants come up. Now, a lot of them aren't native. You know, you're gonna get both because there's seed bed down there. These are Little Bell. There, it's not native. So it's from tropical America. So of course we had to remove that, but we got a photograph of it before we did. But oh man, we're getting a lot of good stuff coming up. Things that should be here. Slender leaf, clammy weed, fragrant oringo. Now this is interesting about this. Two of them came up in an area we had restored and they had not been seen in the preserve for 10 years just shows it the seeds are there they're just waiting they want a chance they want the sunlight to hit the ground they want the rain to hit the ground so after a year or so we had several more of them come up right along the boardwalk there were probably about seven or eight of them and i thought oh great i'm gonna put a sign here putting about restoration how everything just wants a chance I came back a few days later every single one of them were gone you guessed it, those gopher tortoises had been there. So now I have to do this. I have to protect them. So this one is there now. There's a basket to protect it from being eaten by the gopher tortoises. And um, it's interesting about this particular one and it is there now, you can see, come here and see it. We, there was another fire out in Picayune and the ash was falling here in Naples in the city. So I picked some of it up and I ground it up and I put maybe 
uh, heaping tablespoon of it at the base of this plant. At the time, the plant hadn't started to grow upwards. It was just a few leaves on the ground. It took off. It has ended up being more than twice the height of any of the other ones that we had in there pre-fire. Just shows how important ash is. Oh, Ruggles Hori Pea came up too. It's right on the other side of the boardwalk from this one. And here again, there's only three of them. Big favorite of the gopher tortoises. So that'll get fenced in when they start coming up here in the spring. Rough Hedge Hyssop showed up. This is a, a tiny plant. It had not been documented as being in the preserve. Another, another great find, another find showing why this property should have been saved. Ah, Florida milkweed showed up after restoration. Can you find the milkweed? It's that scrawny little plant in the very middle. So the, the plant itself isn't very much, but look at the flowers. And Kara Driscoll is our presenter on February 9th. She has her, gra her graduate project is on the Florida milkweed. And guess what? Our Florida milkweed and the preserve are in her study. So it's very interesting what she's finding out about this plant. You want to make sure you tune in on that. Again, that's February 9th. Ah, wild penny royal came up all over in the flatwoods. That is blooming now and it sometimes blooms, blooms in December. There aren't a lot of flowers blooming at this time of year. So this is very important for our native pollinators, helps provide a food source. Procession flower, another very small one. They came up all over in a lot of the scrub areas where we restored. So now I'm gonna show you some before and after. This is a before. The vines are just covering everything. There's a lot of pine straw out there. So we cleared it. Nothing was growing underneath, absolutely nothing. So what I'm saying clearing, we're not just cutting these vines off, we're removing them from the ground. Cutting them off does no good. They just come up, they even go, grow, you know, are trying to reestablish themselves. So it's actually worse after you cut them off. So it didn't take long after we cleared it. We had all kinds of grasses move in. These are a couple of the flowers. These are ones we want to see. Four petal St. John's wort. There was another area in the flatwoods that we restored. This four petal St. John's wort, wort came up almost like grass. And then the tall elephant's foot. The gopher tortoises love to eat the leaves on this and the flower is a favorite of our native pollinators. Very important plant to have in the preserve. And of course you had grasses and plants coming up. The gopher tortoises moved in and were enjoying themselves. This summer, there was an area that was restored where a lot of grass came up because there's a lot of sand there. Marsh rabbits came. The Eastern Cottontails were there, but the marsh rabbits. We knew they were in the preserve because of our cameras, but the last few years, we hadn't seen any evidence of them still being here. And we never saw them out in the daytime where you could see them. Here, they were out where visitors could see them. So if you notice, they're a little different than the Eastern Cottontail. There's no cottontail on the marsh rabbit. And they're all brown, they're smaller, they have shorter ears, little feet. They're really good swimmers. The marsh rabbit is, is disappearing from the Everglades area, down there, Everglades National Park, and I imagine a big cypress. And you know why, don't you? The Burmese python. This is an area next to the parking lot, completely covered with vines, a lot of exotic vines in here, a lot of exotic trees coming up. We started working on it and we weren't even done and all these scrub plants came up and started blooming. So we thought, oh, we gotta let everybody see this. So FGCU helped finish this up. We put in this path, picnic table. It's a great place to sit and watch the birds, the gopher tortoises, to have a picnic. And when the scrub garden is in bloom in the summer, it's a great place to sit and watch all the native butterflies. These are some of the plants that came up there. And we've actually had to thin out this garden because it's just overcrowded with everything coming up. On the other side of the fence, these would be there in the same profusion. However, guess what? 
These are all favorite food of the gopher tortoise. These are recent restorations. So this is from like mid July to present. We started putting signs out, restoration in progress, so that visitors know what's going on and also to keep our gopher tortoises informed. And this is what happened this summer. This, uh, Dr. Nora Demurs, a, a professor at FGCU's, part of some of her colloquium students came to help with restoration. And this gopher tortoise came and walked among them while they were working and was eating what we had uncovered. I don't think we could have given these students a better thank you. This is out in the meadow area. This would be on the east side of deck three. The cabbage palms have come up and are damaging the old slash pines that are out there. That's before, this is after. Look at the debris under that tree. So we've got that all cleared off. Notice that this slash pine is sitting a little higher. Notice how the ground falls around it. Remember that. I'm going to talk about that here in another minute because I just learned why that is like that. This tree now has a chance to grow and we're starting to get a lot of native plants coming up in that area like blueberries, uh, the tall elephant's foot. A lot of things are coming up. This you can actually see from US 41. Um, if you're headed north on 41 or if you're walking along the sidewalk, this, these saw palmetto were just covered with vines and there were exotics coming up in there. So we did this at Thanksgiving. We went out and cut back the saw palmetto, cut off the fronds. So you can get an idea on how big this is. The FGCU stand, student that's standing in the middle is six foot one. Cutting this back caused the saw palmetto to bloom. The flowers are so important for our native pollinators. And this female green anole had figured out that if I sit in the flowers and I'm really still, these little flies are gonna come and I'll be able to catch them. I don't have to hunt. So pretty smart girl there. So Norm, you know, otherwise um, what comes to this are native, it's like wasp and bees, flies, beetles. Ants, you can see an ant in the lower left-hand corner here. And the saw palmetto produces a fruit that is so important for the wildlife down here. The wildlife eats the fruit when it's black. That's the last stage. It's gooey, it's fermented. So when the gopher tortoises eat it, I don't even have to see them eating it. I can smell it on their breath. But it's a huge food for, besides the gopher tortoises, for raccoons, um, the fox, the Florida box turtles will eat part of this. And in other areas, we don't have these in the preserve, but this is a huge food for the black bear. Super, super important. So see, by restoring around that saw palmetto, we're not only helping the plant, look at, look at how everything's connected. Now it's providing food for all this other wildlife in our area. So what did we discover? Did we have any discoveries around this area that we had just restored? Well, of course, it's out by the street, so there was a lot of trash buried under there. But this was a big discovery. This was amazing. This was huge. That is all growing from one point. This thing has could be centuries old. Just imag imagine if it could talk and tell us what it had seen. Was it here when the Calusa were here? It would have been little, but did it see the Calusa? Did it see the Spanish? I'm sure it saw the development around in the Naples area. If only it could tell us the stories that it had seen. It's amazing. And you can see this from US 41. This is out by deck three. These are, this is very recent restoration. This is on the 41 side of deck three. And to show you how deep the debris is, it's where that yellow ribbon is. Let me get this closer so you can see the depth. So here again, notice how high this pine is sitting from around. So let me tell you a little more about this. 
Clark Riles, who is a senior forester with uh, the Florida Forest Service, came in, was nice enough to come a few weeks ago and help me identify some of the oaks we have out here. When he saw this tree, he got his phone out and he was taking photos. He said, Becky, that tree could be 120 years old. Oh, this is such a great old slash pine. I knew it was old too, and, and we give him a hug all the time. And I asked him though, I said, you know, I've noticed that the old slash pines that we are restoring around, they're all sitting a lot higher than the ground around them. Did people come in here and drag sand out of here? Or, you know, why are they sitting so high? And boy, was I surprised by his answer. He said, no, it's because the ground is sinking down here. He said, think about a big sponge being under the ground. When it's full of water, it's expanded. When you take the water out, it compresses. It's because of the development and all the drainage that's going on. He said it's happening all, happening all over down here. Now, in the case of the preserve, this happened decades ago. This is not a recent development because if you look at the other trees that are growing, the younger ones, they're down at that lower level. And when we clean around the younger slash pine, the ones that might be 50 years old or so, we don't find them elevated. It's these ones that have been here for a hundred years. So the other staff member here at the preserve, Robert and I decided, let's go out and see how much the ground has dropped around these trees. So we went out, we measured, this is a four foot, uh, five foot distance. We had a level out there. So we know this was uh, horizontal. We weren't measuring down the hill. And we measured in a couple places and it's a 12 to 14 inch drop out there. This is an area we're gonna work on this weekend. I've got FGCU students coming. This is that south end of the meadow. I said when we went out there, there are a lot of old slash pines there, which tells us this used to be a flatwoods. So hopefully we can restore this to a flatwoods. We've got a lot of other trees that have moved in and they're trying to change the habitat. But nothing can grow out here but vines. And this is gonna be a really important area when it's restored. When we get this debris out of here, I know there's gonna be a lot of native plants come up in there because they're already on the fringes of this area. So, you know, if you'd like to help with restoration, you can get a group together because of the current restrictions because of COVID-19, the group has to stay under nine people, but you can get a hold of me here at Naples Preserve and maybe we can arrange something. The thing is, we have limited times when we can do restoration. It's not because we don't have time to go out there, it's because if we're being responsible, we wanna look at what's going on out in the preserve. If the birds are nesting, we don't wanna be out there pulling vines out of the trees. If the migrating birds are coming through and stopping, we don't wanna disturb them. When the plants start to come up here in the spring, you know, we're really disturbing. So we just have certain times when we can go out there and work. And here we go, FGCU students jumping for joy. Are they jumping for joy because they really crushed it out there and did a good job? Or is it perhaps because I had just told them, okay, you're done, you can go now. No, it's because they were, they were happy they were helping out. As a matter of fact, a lot of the students will even contact me afterwards. Hey, Becky, did what, what happened to the area? What kind of plants came up? Did the gopher tortoises come in? Are the marsh rabbits coming in and eating where we worked? So they keep an interest in this place. And, I tell you, all the volunteers do a fantastic job and I can't say thank you enough. We couldn't do this without all these volunteers. So with that, I'll have to ask if we have any questions. And we can have a chat here if anybody has any questions. All right. Well, I'm glad you like the talk. It's a little different not doing it in person. So I, you know, I, I just pretend I know you're out there. So I hope everybody enjoyed it. Does anybody have any questions? 
So please remember, okay, here we go. Oh, thank you, okay. So I want everybody to remember that um, these, our programs are recorded. So if you wanna tell somebody else about it or if you wanna watch it at your own leisure, you can uh, go to that same email address, um, ldeperna at naplesgov.com. And Lou's got it set up now. It's really easy to get all these. You just click on the program and you get the link. So all these are recorded so you can watch them again. So next week, we're gonna have a speaker here from Big Cypress talking about the unseen reptiles in Big Cypress. So everybody will wanna make sure that you tune in for that. All right, well, no more questions? Okay, thanks everybody. Have a great week. I know I'm going to.